In our discussion on tonight, we will be discussing 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In the first nine chapters, Paul is writing to the majority of the congregation who love him and appreciate his work. In the remaining chapters, he turns his attention to the ones which was their opposition to his ministry. They were the ones that were professing Christ in the faith, but actually they were false apostles. They were wool and sheep clothing. One of the main jobs for a pastor is to protect his flock. That's why every sheep needs a shepherd. And a lot of people think that they don't need a shepherd because they can do and handle them themselves. But I must remind you that a wolf don't care nothing about your title, nothing about your influence, and nothing about the way you look. He will eat you and your title if you're not careful. So Paul, in chapter 10, three things that he wanted to do. In this chapter, Paul defends his apostleship. In terms of his attitude, we're going to cover the first six verses, and his authority, verses 7 through 11, and his divine commendation verses 12 through 18. Now, in verse 1, Paul says, Now I call myself to seek you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in present am based among you, but being absent and bold towards you. Now indicates a change of subject, and there is also a change in Paul's tone of voice. We must know that boldness and loneliness can be of the same person. And we can look at the life of Jesus because he was lonely and meek, but he was also bold when it comes to getting someone straight, as cleansing those that came in the temple selling and doing things that one got it in the temple. Now, we must know, and someone had said, like in chapter, in verse 2, he says, I beseech you that I may not be bold when I'm present, 
with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as we walk according to the flesh. They said that Paul talked his big talk while he wrote his letters. But they said when he was among them, he was weak and timid. They criticized him as being weak when they would see his face, him face to face. They criticized him as he was a dog that barked loud inside the fence, but when you open the gates, he didn't have much to say. So Paul uh, is telling them, don't make me do it. Don't make me prove to you that this allegation of me is false. Older people would say, don't make me lay down my religion. I wouldn't want you to lay down your religion because you might not be able to pick it back up, but there are some things that you must say and do to correct people in the church. And these were the false teachers who was degrading Paul. In every church, there is something going on. There is somebody against the pastor and there is somebody for the pastor, but there is something going on in every church because I realize that there is no perfect church. And if you find a perfect church, don't you join it because you're going to mess it up. Verse 3 says, For when we walk in the flesh, but we do not walk after the flesh. You see, Paul is telling them that we are human beings just like you are. We go through some of the same, same things. And you say that I'm walking according to the flesh. Yes, I walk according to the flesh, but we do not walk after the flesh. He said that those struggles that they have, he had the same struggle. Jesus have bared all our infirmities. And he was a man and God 100% each way. So Paul is saying, I'm human too. You see, you see me as a person that perhaps I'm not convincing, but if you walk with me a while and see what my work requires me to do, you might have a change of mind. A lot of people think that you're weak. They take your weakness, uh, your meekness for weakness. And that's the wrong way to judge a person by his criteria. And today's, the idea of apostolic authority is chiefly by many of those who claim to be apostles. Everybody wants some type. I'm a pastor. I'm this. I'm that. And Paul didn't have them to know that I didn't get my apostleship from no high school or college. I got mine from the Jesus Christ himself. And that makes me and gives me the authority to discipline you when I need to do so. Verse 4 says, for the weapons of our warfare are not current, but mighty through God to the pulling down of the stronghold. Verse 5 said, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. When Paul fought, his weapon was not material, but spirit. His weapon was suited for spiritual war. Because after all, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And so Paul understood that, that if you're going to fight a spiritual battle, you need spiritual weapons. And he uses, in verse 5, he says, casting down imaginations Every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God 
and bring it into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Here Paul uses a military metaphor. Here they say they are opposing, they have opposition to Paul's work in the gospel. In Ephesians 6, Paul gives us a list of his weapons. If you're going to fight in the army, you need to know what weapon to use under any circumstance that you might find yourself. And the Christian battle, we are Christian soldiers on the battlefield for the Lord. So Paul lists his spiritual weapons. He said, first weapon I use the battle truth. The second one I use the breastplate of righteousness. Three, I use the shoes of the gospel. Four, I use the shield of faith. Five, I use the helmet of salvation. And six, I use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I want to tell you that what you say with your own mind and mouth don't mean nothing. It's only the word of God that has meaning because there's no truth outside of the word of God. Verse 6 says, having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Paul wants to give them ample time to repent. And he don't want to come down so hard on them until they have had ample time to repent. He does not want to deal with them severely because he wants them to come in submission to both the Lord and he himself. That's why I think that when we see a brother overtaken in a fault, we should give them time to repent and just don't throw them all away at the same time that they mess up because God is not willing that any should perish. We have been given chance after chance, so the Lord is patient with us. We have to be patient with them. And when they don't repent after a certain uh, period of time, Paul said, I will discipline them. I'm going to discipline them uh, because I have the authority to do so. There's a time that we must pray, and there's a time that we must perform. Talk. All talk is not good for children. Sometimes you can have to lay a rod down in order to get their attention. Now, verse 7 says, Do ye look on things after do, do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts himself that he is Christ, let him think. Let himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we. Paul is saying, don't judge the book by its cover. Don't judge the content of a packet or by its wrapper. And don't judge the package by its size. Every Christian writer was saying, early Christian writer was saying that Paul, he was small in stature. He had a bald head and he had crooked legs. And I want to tell you that he wouldn't be on Love Island because of his appearance. And sometimes we in the church do preachers that way. We get caught up in the who, the what, and the looks instead of the message that the preacher 
is bringing to us. Paul said, follow me as I have followed Christ. If a preacher is not following Christ, you don't have no reason following him. But if he's following Christ, you shouldn't be just throwing out empty threats about his reputation, what he means to the church, because every preacher is going to be talked about by someone or somebody, but it shouldn't be his own plot to put him down. So, not only do we do preachers that way, we do each other that way, especially in choosing a mate. We, men, we look at women, whether they are 36, 24, and 36, but beauty is on the skin deep. And we go chasing the grass on the other side of the fence. We think that the grass is green. But you don't look the way you used to look in your early annual pictures high school. A lot have changed. You have the handlebars, the crow foot, and other things that don't match up. Most people say you can tell a person weight by measuring them around or his age by measuring them around the waist. So we have to be careful when we judge a person on outside appearance only. Because one day you're going to get old, you're not going to look the same. And you're going to need somebody with love and care to take care of you. And I want to tell you that if you're just looking for beauty, you're looking at the wrong criteria of a woman or a man. You think that you are marrying down, but you might be marrying up. Verse 6 says, And having, we just read verse 6, I'm sorry, but verse 7 says, Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts himself that he is Christ, let himself think again that as he is Christ, even so are we. Paul is saying that you think that you're the only one of Christ. We are of Christ too. We're talking about the minister of the gospel. You're not the only one that of Christ. We are of Christ too. And one of the things we have to realize is that Christ is all in all to whoever accepts him as Lord and Savior. You don't have to apologize to no one and, and find out whether they are in the faith or not because if they are in the faith, they would act like they are in the faith and they would behave like they are in the faith. faith. First they said, for though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord has given us for edification and not for destruction, should not be ashamed, that I might not seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful. But his bold and present is weak, and his speech contemptible. Paul said, I don't want to have to boast to you about my authority. My credentials are strong. In the Lord, whatever I got in my credentials, the Lord gave them to me. So if you're going to brag on anybody, uh, brag on Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying that, and like we should say, you don't want to boast about what God has given you because he can take it back this way. So Paul is, is saying, I am uncomfortable about boasting in my accomplishments. Now, he recognized that Jesus grants authority 
in the church for one reason. He calls it to build the body of believers up and not tear them down. That's why he gave the church a gift. They are not toys to be played with. They are gifts to heal and build and strengthen the body. And this is what Paul is trying to defend this ministry to the Corinthians. Because a few people was there, and this is the one that he's talking about, was trying to degrade Paul and, and, and make him seem like he was an imposter. But Paul was a real deal. Because everything he did, he did to glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 11 says, let such a one think this, that such as we are in word by letter, when we are after, such will we be also indeed when we are present. A lot of people can write a strong letter, but when you see them, they can't bag it up. I hear people in prison, they can write some of the best letters there is. But when they get out, they don't do none of those things that they describe in their letter. I wouldn't like that. Whatever he said in word on his letter, he did it indeed in front of their faces. But they tried to describe him as being weak when he was meek. Just because you don't raise hell or talk bad about somebody and want to fight on every corner, word for word with somebody, they, the world thinks that you're weak. This is the opposite of what Jesus says about us. We ought to be smart as serpents and harmless as dove. This is the Christian character. And we can't lead men to Christ if we do the same thing that they are doing, that they are doing that dishonors our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 12 says, For we dare not make ourselves of none, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measure themselves by themselves, and compare themselves among themselves are not wise. Now, here Paul is speaking of his divine prediction. And when people try to measure themselves by themselves, they are using the wrong dipstick. They're grading their own papers. And anyone grading his own paper can always make a hundred. But I discovered that if God graded our papers, we will get a true scope of what we really are like. When a man thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives his own self. So we shouldn't think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. And a lot of people brag on everything but God. But I want to tell you that Bragging on Jesus is the best thing that you can do because everything that we have, he gave it to us. Everything that we'll be, he'll give it to us. And that's why when I come to church or go anywhere in a setting and the name of Jesus is mentioned, I can brag on him. Why? Because of his benefits and what he can do for a low-down, dirty Sinner like me or us. But we have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And we shouldn't be trying to be more than what we are. God knows us. And we shouldn't let people degrade us and saying that we are not this and we are not that. Self evaluation is a bad thing to do. 
For if one exalts himself, he shall be abased. The nearer we come to God, the more rottenness we see in our bones. I share this testimony in the year that King Uzziah died, said he saw the Lord. But when he saw the Lord, he said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people who are undone. You see, sometimes we can look in the mirror and the worst thing to do when you look in the mirror and you forget the kind of person you saw in the mirror, you can damage your own self. Because God's word is the mirror. And we look into the mirror, we make adjustments. Even when we come out in public, we make adjustments what's not right with our bodies, our clothes, or whatever. But God's word is our mirror. And if we let the Holy Ghost measure us through God's word, he measures us on God's scale, and he looks at the heart. A lot of people are confused or get into wrong motion of looking at things from the outward appearance. God had Samuel to know when he got ready to anoint the next king of Israel, which was David. And Jesse had a bunch of sons. But when, when Samuel tried to pull the oil, the oil went wrong. And they said, surely the next one, tall and handsome, he must be the one. And the oil still went wrong. But Samuel asked him, said, do you have someone else? Yeah, we got a little young brother. He's out in the field watching the flock. He's a steady little boy, but bring him in anyway. And so they all did run. But we have to be careful on how we judge people, how we look at people. We should not make ourselves the measure of others feeling we are superior to them. A lot of people think that they are more than you. At the same time, we cannot let others, on the other hand, we should not let others measure feeling we are failures by our appearance. If a person look real successful on their outward appearance, you think that you're, uh, if you're not up on that chair, you think that you are lower than them, but don't sell yourself short. You just is more than they are. Sometimes you can be a public success but private failures. In verse 13, Paul says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, Verse 13, I'm sorry. But we will not boast of the things of our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God has distributed unto us, a measure to reach even in you. Don't boast about your accomplishments, because boasting is a bad thing to do. Verse 14 said, We stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you, for we are come as far to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. We have, Paul has been to many places establishing churches. Now he's in Corinth, and he's there for their own protection, their own service, in order to enhance their relationship with Christ. And he wasn't afraid to go out and travel in places that he mostly was stoned in a lot of places, rejected by others, because he was 
doing all this to get to them to impart some divine truth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. First, uh, 15 says, he says, for we, for not boasting of the things without our measure, that is, of other man's labor, but having hope. When your faith is increased, then we shall be enlarged by, your, by you, according to our rule abundantly. Power was not interest in riding on someone else's coattail. And he said, I'm running in my own life. A lot of people are running or trying to run in someone else's life. And they're trying to build on another man's foundation. Paul said, I don't have to do this. I've got my foundation laid. And I don't have to be interested in another man's lane of riding his coattail. The only coattail I'm riding is Jesus Christ and him crucified. So verse 17, 16, 17, and 18. To preach the gospel in the region beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hands. For he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. For he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. When we look at Jeremiah, when we look at Jeremiah, the ninth chapter, and we look at verses 23 and 24. Verse 23 in Jeremiah, the ninth chapter. Verse 23 says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glories glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So if you're going to glory about anybody or anything, you ought to glory about the Lord. You don't have to be rich or poor or any other. Everybody can glory uh, about the Lord. Everybody can give glory to the Lord. And this is what makes it so universal. You don't have to be of no special group, but you can give glory to the Lord. And he says, verse 18, for not he that commanded him himself is approved but whom the Lord commanded. Who are you and what do you want to approve of? If you don't approve by men, then you'll get a man reward. But I don't want to be approved by man. What he thinks or says about me is only what God says about me is important. And Paul said, I'm not going to we're going to continue to preach the gospel in the region beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. Paul said, when I leave here, I'm not, that's not going to stop me from preaching the gospel to other regions. I'm going to continue preaching this gospel to 
whosoever will. So if we're going to pray on anybody, we need to pray on Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I hope this lesson or this discussion has shed light on some things that might be able to help us in the future. But God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. The grass wither and the flower fade, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever and ever. Thank you for your attention and let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you once again for allowing us to study out of your word. We pray even now that we will take some of these precepts and concepts of Paul and mentioned in his epistle. That we might not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. And I will most of all give you the glory for the things that you have done for us. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.